tankers transport some of the most dangerous, flammable cargo that's carried at sea. Yet, when was the last time you heard of one actually exploding? Sure, you do hear of tankers that have suffered fires and explosions. One happened quite recently, the Stoke Gronland in Korea. We've also had numerous tankers damaged in the Gulf. Yep, none of them have truly exploded. I'm talking about the sort of explosions we've seen with rockets and cars that have been engulfed in flames. In these explosions, there's almost nothing left. This has happened with ships in the past. In 1976, the tanker Sansonina exploded in Los Angeles. The resultant shockwave literally blew the ship apart and it shattered windows on houses over 20 miles away. How then do modern tankers carrying thousands of tons of flammable fuel not just explode in the same way the Sansonina did in the 1970s? To answer that, we need to know a little behind the science of burning hydrocarbons. We all know that burning is just the process of a fuel reacting with oxygen and giving off heat. Obviously in our case, the fuel source we're talking about is the cargo that's carried and the oxygen is in the air. Let's assume we're just carrying a random hydrocarbon fuel in this tank and it's a liquid at atmospheric pressures and temperatures. The liquid itself doesn't burn. That's kind of obvious if we think about it. There's no oxygen within the liquid itself. It's only actually the vapors that burn. As fuel evaporates off the surface, it mixes with the oxygen in the air, and then it just takes a heat source to ignite. The exact proportion of fuel vapor to air needed to catch light does vary, but we can represent that on a flammability diagram. Up the side here, we have the percentage of hydrocarbon gas, and along the bottom, we have the percentage of oxygen. If you only have a tiny amount of hydrocarbon gas in the air, clearly it's not going to ignite. We say the mixture is too lean. Likewise, if you have too much hydrocarbon gas, we say it's too rich. We're left with this area in the middle. So next, we come to the oxygen content. Obviously, normal air has around 21% oxygen, so there's no point going above that because we're not pumping extra oxygen in. This line actually slopes a little because the oxygen percentage will naturally decrease when you start mixing in fuel particles. Finally, at the lower end here, we have the part of the graph representing a low oxygen level. If the oxygen level is too low, again, clearly it's not going to ignite. We say the mixture is inert. You do reach a point where the oxygen percentage is just right if you have the perfect percentage of fuel. Then, as the oxygen level increases, the range at which the fuel could burn expands. Within this area, we have the flammable zone. If the proportions fall within this, a heat source will ignite the mixture. So how can we control that? In a way, the percentage of hydrocarbon is out of our control. It naturally evaporates from the surface of the fuel, so the concentration will vary throughout the tank. So that leaves us with the oxygen. The only way we can prevent ignition is to lower the percentage of oxygen close to the fuel so that it becomes inert. You basically need to add an inert gas, helium, nitrogen, argon, or compounds like carbon dioxide, just something that won't allow the fuel to burn. Obviously, there are cost implications for the noble gases, so argon and helium are not really a commercially viable option. So that leaves you with nitrogen and carbon dioxide. If you want to go to the expense of generating the gas and containing it, you'll probably use nitrogen, as it's in a high percentage in the atmosphere anyway, so it's going to have minimal impact on the cargo in terms of contamination. If contamination is not a concern, you can use carbon dioxide, and the massive advantage of carbon dioxide is that ships have a carbon dioxide generator already, the main engine. It produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct of combustion of its own fuel. All we need to do is to clean up the exhaust, and we can do that with an inert gas plant. We first pass the flue gas through a scrubbing tower, and that cools it down and removes solid contaminants. We then send it through powerful fans that can maintain the same pressure as the cargo tanks, and this is to stop the tanks buckling if you're emptying them out too quick, much like a bottle of water that you squeeze too hard. As it crosses the safety barrier into the cargo area, it then passes through some sort of a non-return valve. Commonly, this is a water seal. The inert gas can happily bubble through and flow to the tanks, but if flammable vapor from the tanks tries to come out, it creates a water plug, which blocks the return to the rest of the ship. Of course, the system itself is somewhat more complicated than this. We've got numerous isolation valves, PV breakers, and temperature protection systems, but for today, this is plenty to get our heads around. 
Overall, it allows us to pipe the engine's exhaust through the cargo tanks, lowering the percentage of oxygen. This plays back into that flammability diagram, bringing the tank atmosphere safely down into the inert area. It's no longer possible for the flammable cargo vapours to ignite. And this is why fires and explosions on modern tankers don't result in the same catastrophe that we witnessed in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Hopefully you found today's topic interesting. For more videos like this every other Friday, be sure to subscribe right here on the channel. Until next time, thank you for watching, and goodbye.